we'll go ahead and get started so that we are respectful of everybody's time today. Um, we are here for the virtual septic care workshop presented by WaterWise. We are a part of the University of Arizona's Cooperative Extension based out of Cochise County. Um, it is myself, I am Nicole Miller, and I am the youth coordinator and work a bit with the community side. Marianne Capehart is our community program director. A couple of housekeeping things, and then Marianne will be doing introductions. Um, please keep yourself muted throughout the presentation today. This kind of, and I think I have enabled that. I will allow you uh, the option if you need to ask a question at the end, you can unmute yourself and then ask that question. But if you have questions throughout the presentation today, please be um, typing those into the chat box so that you don't forget them. And we'll, um, Marianne will be monitoring them as Kit goes through her presentation and asking them as needed. The presentation is being recorded. So if at any point you need to go back and um, you forgot something or you wanna revisit it, it will be available on our YouTube channel. And then the last thing I wanna mention is I will be sharing a post-event survey via email with you uh, as the event concludes today. I would greatly, we would greatly appreciate that being filled out. It helps us to improve our presentation. So with no further ado, Marianne. Good morning, everybody. So nice to see you here. I think we have some veteran fans of Kit Farrell Poe's, our speaker today on septic care. So I'm gonna keep my introduction brief. I know she has a lot to say, um, but Kit Farrell Poe is department head and professor at the University of Arizona, Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering, and she's part of the CALS Cooperative Extension. Um, her work focuses on um, education programs in cooperation with county, faculty, their clientele, and state federal agencies as well, local public officials, teachers, farmers, and ranchers. So boy, does she know a lot. And she's been in the field a long time and um, can answer probably any of your questions. Um, so yeah, we wanna take good care of our septic um, to keep our uh, waters clean as well as our homes functioning well. So without further ado, I will give it over to Kit. Thank you. Kit, you're still muted. Yep, yep, I am. <laughs> So good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending virtually. I am going to miss seeing you in person. I've really enjoyed my experiences coming down to Sierra Vista. Uh, I was recalling how many years I've been doing this. I've lived in Tucson for about 11 years. And I came from Yuma, which is where I used to live, all the way over to Sierra Vista to do, to do these presentations. So it's been a number of years and I still enjoy it. And so um, I am looking forward to um, meeting with you today and answering questions and helping you be more informed. And I, am, I see that there's some bugs in the septic and we will cover that in, hopefully soon. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. All right, so we're gonna be covering the septic system basics for homeowners. So today we're going to be talking in general, just what is an on-site wastewater treatment system? What are the components of the septic system? What is treatment and dispersal? And why do we need both? And then we're gonna talk about management, which is really important. See, I am actually going to, before we get there, whoops, doot, doot, doot. this is new for me. I get to share with you a poll. And let me see, I'm going to do a poll. And I want you to answer four questions for me so that I can get a better idea of who is in the audience. So. I would like to know if you are a homeowner, renter, if you're a regulator, realtor, real estate agent, um, educator, practitioner in the system, if you own a septic system or you operate one, what your normal level of understanding is, and then if you've ever attended any of the previous septic system workshops. So then I can change up my jokes. <laughs> there you go. So. I, uh, you need to answer all four questions before I 
end the polling, and then I plan to share the results so that you can get an idea of who all's in the audience. I have a couple more people. I'd love to get a And if one more person would answer, then we would have a, a fine group of participants. I'll give you five more seconds and then we'll close it so that we can move on. Okay. Now I'm gonna share the results. So six of you are homeowners one person is a practitioner thank you for attending how many people have a septic system well six of you do how would you rate your current level of understanding fair and that's fair and then have you attended any of the previous u of a septic workshops one person said yes thank you for coming back and the rest of you have not so thank you so much for uh, participating, and that gives me a better idea of who's in the audience. All right. Let's see if I can move forward. There we go. So these are some of the common pollutants that a septic system needs to take care of. We have microorganisms. Now, not, as you remember, not all microorganisms are harmful. Really, it's just the pathogens. And so we need to make sure that we take care of the pathogens without killing the good bacteria and fungi and microorganisms that live in the soil. We have nutrients that we have to take care of, primarily the nitrogen. And uh, phosphorus is also something we need to be worried about for surface waters, but nitrate is something that we worry about for groundwaters. We have suspended solids we need to get rid of. We oftentimes, and we don't want to see that there's some toxics, but now that, uh, well, we have people that are on chemotherapy or some kind of health-related drug that they're, they excrete, which ends up into our septic system and then may end up in our soil. We want to make sure that those are removed before they travel to the groundwater. And then we have some organics, which I'm labeling as pesticides. All of those need to be treated by our septic system. So what is an on-site wastewater treatment system? It's, it is comprised of the source, which is our house, then we have some kind of pretreatment device. And this pretreatment device is typically a, a septic tank. And then it goes to the final treatment and dispersal. And here are examples of a trench. And these would be drop boxes um, because this is on a hilly terrain. But it's because some soils are thin or some soils have too much rock or some soils are, are too close to groundwater, you oftentimes may need additional pretreatment to get it up to a higher level of cleanliness before we disperse it into the soil. So what should our septic system do? It should treat the sewage which is what we are aware of. And we wanna make sure that we are not contaminating public health or the environment. But we also need to disperse that sewage over a large area and not funnel it all into one place. And ultimately what we wanna do is we want to put the level of risk at an acceptable level septic systems and even wastewater treatment systems don't have a hundred percent it's not a hundred percent risk free but we what we want to do is we want to make it at a level that we can accept so the goals of treatment is that we need to separate the solids 
We also want to reduce the amount of organic materials. And for those of you that have taken any chemistry or are aware, this is what we would measure. The measure of organic materials is called BOD or biochemical oxygen demand. And what happens is that the uh, bacteria and the microorganisms in the water can eat up those organic materials. And the more bacteria that, the more the organic materials are in the water, that means the stronger that wastewater is. And so you need more bacteria to break down that organic material. And then we also need to reduce organic materials, um, nutrients, pathogens, and to toxic discharges. So in that blue, in the blue areas, that's what will happen in the septic tank. And in the white, that's what will happen in the soil treatment area. Now, our goals of dispersal is that we want to distribute the effluent over a large area because we want to keep that soil unsaturated and aerobic. And we'll get into that a little bit more detail about what that means. But we don't want to dump it all in one area because it, will, um, it won't keep the soil aerobic or unsaturated. And then we want to provide enough time in the soil so that treatment can take place around each one of the soil particles. And so too much sand or gravel may make it go down too fast, but we need it to be able to percolate. So too much clay can keep it in the soil too long, depending on how fast you use your wastewater or how fast you use your water. Because ultimately we want, we need to percolate down through the soil and then it joins the hydrologic cycle, usually through groundwater or into our streams. And it can be recycled back into the water cycle. So what are the components? So we already talked about that uh, there's uh, source treatment, pretreatment, there's the um, distribution, final treatment and dispersal. And now we're gonna talk about sources. So what we need to do is we, the septic system by law needs to treat all the sewage. Now you can have a gray water system, but if that gray water system should break down or for some reason you can't, um, you need to be able to divert all waters into your septic system. So there are some people that have a septic system that's on the verge of not working correctly. So they take out the gray water and they think they fix the problem. But by law, that's not true. You need to be able to treat all of it through the septic system. And so there's some controversy about water softeners and the water softener backwash. And what we, what we have found, the industry is actually not, doesn't, it's, it's controversial in the industry because what we have seen is that when you put the back, uh, the backwash, the backwater wash, backwash from the water softeners into your septic system, it is very salty. And so that salt actually keeps the separation from happening and sort of keeps things more, um, it doesn't separate things out. And so then that goes into the soil and believe it or not, it's, that's the problem, not so much as the salts. So we prefer that you don't put your water softener backwash into the sewage if possible. You may put it into a French drain and a French drain merely is an excavation that's backfilled with gravel and then you would put it through there and let it seep into your soil. Also, your source, your biggest threat to ruining a system is not managing your water. So you need to really conserve your water. That means you don't have a washing day. So Saturday is not, let's get all the washing done in one day. What I'm going to recommend to you is that you, you only do two loads a day separated by eight to 10 hours. 
Now you can also, if you've got a front end loader that's water conserving, you can get by with about three loads a day, but again, spread out over time. If you can do a setback, my, uh, one of my washers, um, we have two units at our house. Um, one of the washers, you can actually set back and do it at night. Um, our dishwasher is also, there's a time delay. So you can do those um, big uh, volumes of water during an off peak time. So taking a shower, doing your dishwasher and uh, doing your clothes washer all at the same time would be problematic. Because remember, the water that you put into the septic tank then gets pushed out into the soil treatment area. So when you flush um, your toilet, a gallon and a half, two gallons goes in, one and a half and two gallons goes out. So whatever you put in goes out. So that's why you need to spread out your water use. And the reason why is because we want to have the time in the septic tank about two to three days. You want it to stay in there, which gives it time for the solids to settle out. And it also then spreads out the use of that into your uh, soil treatment area, which will then keep your soil treatment area um, unsaturated and aerobic. So something that you also need to think very carefully about is properly disposing of cooking oils. Now, we also, um, there are fats, oils, and greases, and that's how we're going to refer to them. When I, when I speak of fats, I'm thinking of fats that are solids at room temperature, and they're typically uh, animal products, but they don't have to be. Crisco uh, is not an animal product, but it's a uh, oil that's uh, usually plant-based. Oils, I'm going to think of that are typically liquids at room temperature. And both of them can cause different problems. Now, greases, I'm defining as petroleum-based. And you don't ever want to put petroleum-based greases into your septic system. And they could be either solid or liquid at room temperature. You can think of uh, um, engine greases, uh, ball bearing greases, uh, bearing greases, or there's uh, motor oils. And so you can see that petroleum can be both liquid and solid at room temperature. And again, you keep those out of your septic system. Something else you should be taking out of your septic system is hair, even human hair. So all showers and bathtubs should have a hair net, hair um, capturing device because it doesn't break down. I don't know if you've ever seen mummies, but oftentimes people who have been buried for even long, long periods of time still have their hair. It just doesn't degrade. Well, it doesn't degrade in the septic system either. So when you are shampooing your pets, it's best to do it outdoors or making sure that you capture all of that hair. And that hair doesn't tend to like to fall out. It usually gets caught in the scum layer and it is a, it's a nuisance for your pumpers to try and get out. Other chemicals and uh, materials that should never go into the septic system are what you see here. These are mostly petroleum products. You see paint remover, you see uh, motor oil, you see gasoline. These should never go into the septic system. And what I want you to note is that septic tanks should only receive pre-digested foods. And what that means is that it's foods that go through your body first. So I've got another poll that I would like to share with you. Please let me know if you have or use a garbage disposal. All right, thank you everyone.
So the results are, yes, I have one, but I don't use it often. No, I don't have one. It's about an equal between the two, and one person doesn't have a septic system. And I'm really glad to hear that no one uses their septic, their um, garbage disposal with pride. And we're going to um, talk about why it's not a good idea to have, to use your septic, your, your garbage disposals. Because what, because I just had said that what should go down the septic tank is pre-digested food and it could be your toilet paper. So there's a higher risk of solids carrying over to the drain field because once you chop it all up, those food particles that think of uh, chopping up the lettuce, lettuce is going to be so lightweight that it doesn't settle out and can get caught in the gas bubbles that go up and it doesn't get and then can be carried over into your soil treatment area. And so what I recommend is that you take what you see here, all of those chicken scrap, ch ch kitchen scraps, and um, compost them or put them in the waste paper basket. If you do tend to use it, um, and new homes, even if you don't want to put one in, oftentimes the next person might put one in. You might want to increase the septic tank size, you might double it, um, because that gives the, t that the solids more time to drop out. Then you should also pump out your solids more often, probably twice as often as you would normally do it. And we definitely need to use an effluent screen. And I'll talk about that more uh, in a little bit. Also with the source, there are two other things I wanted to talk about. One is the uh, toilet paper. There is no such thing as septic safe toilet paper. There's no standards published on what makes a septic tank safe toilet paper. The only thing that I can tell you is the, um, when I talk to pumpers, the toilet paper that they hate is Charmin. Charmin does not break down. There must be some kind of cloth or plastic or softener in there that just does not break down in septic tanks and it gets actually wrapped up in sometimes the the blades that they use to remove and so i would ask you to avoid charmin but you don't have to have septic the um, toilet paper that you can see through because then you use yards and yards of it um, so that's the one thing I want to talk about. And the other thing is laundry detergent. There is a recommendation to not use, well, that, that liquid is better than powdered. And the reason why is in the olden days, one of the binders that they used for the, um, the, the powdered ones was actually clay. And those settle um, out and can be um, problematic. So uh, you don't have to use a liquid, but it, it is easier on your septic system if you do use a liquid. And there are no brands that we've um, discovered that are better or worse than others. And again, there are no septic system safe ones. Uh, there is, again, no industry standard for that either. Before I move on, I want to see if there are any questions that I need to address before I move on to pre-treatment. And again, someone's going to have to, I don't have the, um, let me see. I can put the chat. Um, chat go. Okay. Kit, I had a question. Um, yes. And I think it's in the chat. Um, this is a little bit of an aside, but do you compost hair in your compost system? Do I compost? Compost hair. Oh, uh, no. You just, you put it in the landfill? Mm-hmm. There's okay. real, well, you can try, but there's really yeah. not a lot that, that eats up hair. I yeah. mean, think about it. Uh, even when they embalm, it's not going away. I guess, so 
it's not going to, it's just not going to break down. And I don't think you're going to be happy with it. Um, okay. composting it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So next we're going to go into pre-treatment. And the whole purpose of pre-treatment is to pre-treat the wastewater to prepare it for downstream components. But in our case, it's mostly going to be to prepare it to go into the soil. And we want to be able to protect the soil. So the septic tank needs to operate correctly. And let's talk about that septic tank. Now, this is a one chamber tank, and we'll talk about why we don't use these anymore. But the function of the pretreatment is to separate out the soils, solids, the solids, the oils, and the greases from the liquid to create three distinct layers. There's going to be the scum layer, which rises up to the top. There's going to be this clear zone, which looks a lot like tea, believe it or not, and then there's the solids at the bottom. It allows for a little bit of, whoops, a little bit of um, breakdown of uh, anaerobic decomposition. It does a little bit, but not a lot. And then it keeps the sewage in the tank for, like I said, uh, one to two days so that once it comes down, it can then um, have enough time to settle, either go up or go down, so that it doesn't, this actually shows that the screen is in the solids, which is not what we want. And so we really want to take the uh, this clear zone and bring it out into the soil treatment area. It's also a place to store solids because we don't want the solids to end up in our soil. One thing that you may not think about is that it also dissipates the energy from the wastewater. So here it's coming from the house. And we, the reason why we have the sanitary tea is that it takes the wastewater and it puts it down in a gentle way into this clear zone. If you have your washing machine up on the second floor, and then you put your septic tank 10 feet below, you could have a 20 or 30 foot drop and that could create quite a bit of churning. And what we don't want is a lot of churning right in here to stir up the sludge. So what we want is things to come into the septic system in a uh, calm, uh, a calm manner. So when the combination, the depth of the scum and sludge build up together, it will then narrow this clear zone. And um, then it becomes, you have less and less time for the solids to be able to drop off and for the scum to rise up. So once it becomes about 25%, 20, 30%, then we want people to pump it out. And typically that's going to be three to five years. And that really changes. It, it really, man, it, it's dependent on how you manage your water, how much solids you put into it, how many people are living in the house, what whether you use a lot of um, uh Fats, oils, and grease, you fry a lot of things. So it, it really is dependent on a lot of different um, things. So what is a septic tank? What are the components of a septic tank? So a sanitary tea is what we prefer to see. There are other baffles that you may have that are different. Uh, and But we like sanitary teas because, again, it puts the material down into the um, clear zone and it doesn't plop it on top of the scum layer and then we have a sanitary tea that goes out. Then um, we normally have in Arizona two compartments. Um, this shows a one compartment again. We have a, a effluent screen. Uh, so many people call it an effluent filter but that's an incorrect term. 
it's okay if you use a filter. It is not optional here in Arizona. All new construction as of the 2000, early 2000s, needs to have an effluent screen. And we'll talk about them more later. Then we want to see inspection ports over each of the baffles, the inlet baffle and the outlet baffle. And then we want a manhole to do the pumping out of. Now notice that these are smaller in size. They're typically about four inches the, uh, so that you can just, they're for inspection. That's all they're for. And then um, the manhole itself is where you pump out and they're typically much bigger. They're around 12 inches, 14 inches in diameter. And that's where you pump out. You do not want to pump out of these small holes because you can't get into the corners very well. So here are some, so back in the 70s, we used to have uh, these, um, these uh, lids that were not accessible, they were buried. And then um, it was a one compartment tank. And this uh, didn't have a sanitary tea. And um, oftentimes there were, it's a clamshell. So it's two pieces of concrete that come together and they could um, leak around the, um, the seams right here. And again, what we've done over the years is that we've made these better um, so that we have a sanitary tea. We have access. Now, this is a large one, but I would like to see an access port on here. Then you also, um, so, and then this is a big effluent screen. Um, they're not always this big. And so you have the, the sanitary tea coming in. You have a two uh, compartment, which is required by rule. And then, uh, and this is two thirds, one third, if you put them, um, if you want to measure it out. So septic tank materials, you're going to see all kinds. You're going to see concrete. You're going to see fiberglass. You're going to see plastic. And um, concrete ones, this is one with a lid, and um, this uh, they come in different sizes. There is no ones that are better or worse than others, but you, there are management ones that you have to be careful about. For instance, when you pump out a plastic tank, because it doesn't weigh a lot, it can actually rise up out of the ground because it weighs so little. And so what we have to do is we have to make sure that those are strapped down. And sometimes because these are so lightweight and they don't, you can actually carry them to the site, these um, fiberglass or plastic tanks are often used in difficult to access places, but no one is better than other ones. But notice that you need some kind of rigidity um, ribs to support the soil that's on the outside of those tanks so that they don't collapse. Something else that I want you to be aware of is that tanks need to be water tested, need to be tested for water tightness. In Arizona, our rules say that when they that all tanks need to be certified um, when they are purchased. The problem is with that idea is that things can happen in delivery, then in installation where the tanks no longer are uh, watertight. And the other problem with Arizona's rules is that they only test the tank to the level of the um, uh, the lid. And so it doesn't do, it doesn't help with the um, seals around the lids or the, the riser up to the surface. So um, we want um, watertight at installation, not at just the purchase. So with we've been talking about often on the septic tank outlet screens, they fit into the septic tank. And we've, we've been seeing a lot of them this size, but typically they're more like this, about a four inch. And these, the lids uh, come off 
where they can be washed and um, cleaned out. Now, the septic tank screens help filter out the solids so that they don't go into your soil treatment area. It also helps off, it can help lessen the energy of any surge flow. So <clears throat> let's say you have a big party and people start flushing the toilets a lot, you may have a surge. And so some screens can help with this energy. Now, what you need to know is that it goes into the outlet of the tank and it can go inside that sanitary tea. There are some that are made for that. You can see these three uh, three or four models here that do that. Um, and then there's some that actually replace um, that sanitary tea and uh, house a much bigger but, um, screen. And they also, um, these, these larger ones are the ones that can actually uh, less, can um, help with that surge flow. But I want you to know that it will plug periodically. It's doing its job. So it needs careful periodic cleaning. You can do it or you can hire a professional to do it. Just merely taking it out. You could actually buy two so that you take one out and you put one back in so that you always have a clean one um, available to use or you can hire a professional to do it. Um, so this is an example where a... Um, where a person is actually wearing gloves and a mask and probably a face shield so nothing sprays up into their face and then they spray it down into that manhole. Now this is a sludge judge that you can purchase. It has a foot valve on the bottom and what you do is you uh, slowly lower this stick down into the um, into the septic tank in a vertical manner. And then when you tap the bottom, it closes the foot valve. And then when you bring it back up, you actually can see the layers within your septic tank. Now, you don't have to, um, there are, uh, I have on my website, a series of fact sheets that will help you, that there are other low cost ways of doing it. In fact, um, a real easy way is you take a uh, two by four or a one by one wooden um, rod uh, or board, and then you put a cotton sock around it or a cotton rag or even cotton rope. Now that rope Everything has to be washed really well because you don't want anything brand new that has sizing on it. Because what you want to do is you're going to coat that in that rod, then you're going to lower that rod down into it, and then you're going to lift it up slowly. And believe it or not, it will stick to that cotton rope or that cotton uh, rag, and it will show you where your scum and your your solids are. So that's a way of taking care of it. And we mentioned that when the combined sludge and scum is between 25 and 30, 33% you need to pump it out. You need to have it inspected and you need to have it inspected for structural soundness and for um, baffles and inlet um, um, and all inlets and in, uh, that are intact. Now, this inspection is required upon the sale of a home, but I highly encourage that you get it done. If, if you're a new owner, I would, uh, a, after a year of owning the house, I would get it pumped out because you knew it a, a year before it was pumped out, then you find out what, because then it would tell you what your typical use is and how much you've generated. And that gives you a lot of information. I would be there when the person is pumping it out so that you get an idea what's going on. And when someone pumps it out, do not let them tell you that they need to leave some sludge in the bottom. That is not true. Um, that's the hardest part to remove. All bits need to be removed so that they can actually see if there are any cracks in the bottom or if there's any root intrusions 
uh, if there's any rebar showing. So you absolutely need to have your tank completely um, uh, pumped out. Now I'm going to do another poll. And let's look at septic tank additives. Do any of you used a septic tank additive? I have one more person. Thank you. We're going to end polling and I'm going to share the results. And seven of you have never used one. Two of you have. And again, we have one person that hasn't. Thank you for putting that in because I forget from time to time. So, um, so not using an additive actually is what I'd like to see because there is no published scientific evidence showing that additives increase system lifespan. And if anybody sells you or tries to sell you a septic tank additive because you never have to pump it again, run away, run away really fast because there, one of two things could be happening. One, it could be munching up everything and then it gets put back into the septic tank and now you don't have a clear layer and all of that goes over into your slut, over into your soil treatment area. Or the other thing is that they're just plain not telling you the truth and then you're building up this sludge and scum layer that's going to ultimately harm your soil treatment system. And the most expensive part is the soil treatment system. Now, I will sometimes consider enzymes or bacteria for systems that uh, receive a lot of um, chemotherapy drugs or, or medications, and it sort of kills the septic tank, at which time your um, bowel movements, which is really the only thing that you need to seed a septic tank, is a good bowel movement. Um, sometimes the medications are so strong and they pass through the body so much that having a little bit of help through an enzyme or bacteria can be helpful. Now, before we go on to the final treatment and dispersal, does anybody have any questions? Hi, um, it looks like we have a question from Madeline. Um, just to note, to, is it a courtesy to ask if you can watch while the pumper is working? If someone asks me, I will say yes, but I had a very uncomfortable experience with people watching from the windows, <laughs> hidden cameras, et cetera. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, so, um, I would, that's a great, a, a great question. And I agree with you that it's the polite thing to do to ask to watch them pump it out. Um, and because I, most pumpers want people to be informed and um, what, unfortunately, every industry has people that take shortcuts. And um, what we want is our industry, the on-site wastewater industry, to be trusted. And um, because they do, they're the front line defense of protecting our groundwater and they need to do it right. And what we don't want, we don't want dogs around, we don't want children around because they can be distracting, they can also be in the way. And um, we are working with uh, waste, human waste that should not be um, uh, exposed to other people. So uh, as a homeowner, if you are having your um, septic tank pumped, ask. That's a very good question. I'm sorry that I didn't um, point that out. But yes, um, they should um, ask if they can be there. Uh, and and a, to me, 
a uh, knowledgeable septic tank pumper will say yes because uh, it's a great time to inform people and especially if if they see that there's a practice that is they can um, they can see by looking at the, the the lid the bottom of the lid if there's been some mismanagement too much water being used they can see if toilet paper's hanging off of there and so they can help the homeowner understand maybe that some of their practices aren't doing too good we um, have another question um, from Glenn um, why is the screen in your picture being washed over the cleaning port, which would effectively put the same material right back in the tank? Because it's the um, most hygienic place to put it. Um, and so it's the amount of solids coming off is not as much um, as uh, what's going to go in. And it, uh, we want to put it in a safe place. Now, um, because unless you're going to dig a hole and put it, e even digging a hole and putting it into the ground is not my favorite um, thing to do. You can do it for small amounts, but I would prefer to put it back in the septic tank. And then um, eventually you're going to get that pumped out. Good Thank question. You. All right. Moving on, we're going to be talking about final treatment and dispersal, and typically that is going to be your soil treatment system. Some people have mounds as their final treatment and dispersal. Some people have drip dispersal, but most people have uh, our conventional soil treatment systems in Arizona. Conventional is defined as a septic tank followed by a uh, trench, bed, chamber, or seepage pit. Those are our four conventional soil treatment systems, and then it's gravity fed. And so what we have is this network of trenches. These trenches are typically one to three feet wide. They can be up to 100 feet long, and depending on how much how big your house is and the type of soil you have then dictates how many of these trenches you have. A bed like what you see over on your right is wider. It's uh, five feet, uh, sometimes longer. Chambers are usually the, um, the same width, three feet, and then they have this plastic dome-like structure that is put in place of gravel. And then seepage pits, not my favorite form of uh, treatment because there's no treatment, it's just dispersal, is essentially a four foot, five foot diameter hole that's typically 25 feet deep, sometimes known as a ver vertical trench. Those are the um, what's, what's typical in Arizona and typically, well, only in Arizona. Only gravity distribution is uh, makes for a conventional. The minute you introduce a pump, then it becomes an alternative system in Arizona. So what the soil treatment area does, it receives the effluent and from the septic tank and then transmits it to the soil. It then provides underneath, there's not much treatment on the sidewalls, but underneath it provides physical filtration, biological activity, and chemical reactions that take place around the first few feet, um, hopefully within, in Arizona, it's five feet we allow um, for the treatment to take place. So the way um, pathogens get captured is that they, uh, we create a slime layer or a biomat around each soil particle. And this can only happen if the soil is aerobic and unsaturated. So all of this area between the soil particles is the open pore space. And if you have saturated, it goes through this big pore area, but it doesn't stick around the outside area. So what we want is aerobic unsaturated so that the pathogens stick to this 
biomat. And then the other thing that can happen is that there's an ionic charge to both, well, to some viruses um, have a uh, positive charge and they will stick to the soil particle. The other thing that can happen is that it um, has, well, this is an example of the um, ionic attraction and the, um, the positive virus is being attracted and held onto by the negative charge around the soil particle. The other thing that can happen is that it's just too big, too big to fill, go through the soil um, pore and it gets trapped physically and it uh, dies. And the last way is that there are predators in the soil that are aerobic and they, uh, uh, the prey then would be the anaerobic uh, pathogens that get stuck there temporarily and that gives opportunity for these predators to um, uh, kill those so soil microbes. So those are the four ways. There's the uh, pathogens are, are captured in the slime. They um, are uh, connected through ion exchange and they die from old age. They can have predators from the soil microbes or they can um, just not fit through those soil pores and they get trapped and they die of old age. So, this is a way of thinking about it, that the soil needs to remove the disease-causing organisms and some of the chemicals of concern. So this is, this is what, if you haven't seen the hydrologic cycle, it, where you have your precipitation, you have overland flow, eventually it then works its way down into groundwater, and then it can seep into streams or it can be pumped back up. And so we need to return the water back to the water cycle as clean as we can get it. So here is what the hydrologic cycle would look like um, with a septic system. So you have your source, you have your pretreatment, you have your soil treatment area, and then it, it travels down through, um, it can go this way, hopefully through unsaturated flow, but then it gets, it can have some saturated flow in which, or it has this restrictive layer and it just flows over the top because it can't get through the soil fast enough and it can go into a nearby waterway. It can, um, luckily with this area of unsaturated flow, then it can go into the regional water table. And then that is why we have setbacks of 100 feet from any part of the septic system to a well. And, um, and that this is why in Arizona, we require five feet of unsaturated aerobic soil. Other states have less than that, um, but five feet is what is required in Arizona. So the way effluent moves, it enters the soil treatment area and then it disperses out into underneath the soil treatment and it will spread out a little bit and again this is where our five feet of unsaturated soil is and um, it's also this area is also known as the treatment zone it's the biologically active area um, or zone and it's also known as the biozone. It's the aerobic area. So I'm going to back up a little bit. So one of my concerns with a bed is that beds are so wide. This is where the oxygen comes from. It comes from the side and it can move underneath. That's why the narrower the 
uh, trenches, the better, because then oxygen can move around the outside and get underneath it. The wider the base is, the wider this is, a bed actually can be problematic to get enough air underneath to the middle. And that's why seepage pits are not my favorite, is because they're so deep, 25 feet down, you just don't get enough oxygen underneath it to get the treatment that we need. So the treatment zone, so the that's what we're saying that the longer, narrower, shallower a trench is, the better the treatment is. So how do we get the the effluent to move through the trench. Well, typically they move through the trench through gravel and it's um, at a, uh, it's a gravity, so, but it's a, like at a 1% grade, it's pretty shallow. Or these are different kinds of chambers. Remember I said that they were a plastic um, frame and underneath there is just uh, native soil. There's also these tubes and then there's easy flow, um, there's a bunch of different ways that they move the effluent to distribute it evenly across the trench. When we construct our septic systems, this is where the most, we have to be the most cautious. So one, we want to make sure that the the gravel that we use is clean, that it doesn't have too many fines because fines will eventually settle out and then it can blind or it can uh, coat the surface of the native soil and create a, uh, a restrictive layer and it must be clean. So, and no limestone because limestone will degrade over time. The soil conditions, you need to have it dry and natural. If you're installing under wet conditions, it can increase the um, risk of compaction and soil smearing. So um, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And then we need to make sure that there is no run on to the system. So we want to divert water from away from the soil treatment area. So compaction is something we need to worry about. If we, we want to, we don't want trucks to be driving across our soil treatment area, either before being put in or after being put in or when you're managing it. And then we want to make sure that the material is clean. We want to make sure that the soil conditions are um, dry and not wet. And what I just said about um, the, that we want to make sure that the water, it's not the low point of, the, of your property. So how are the pieces put together? They're put together in parallel. So it comes out of say the septic tank and comes out of the septic tank and then it goes into a distribution box and by engineering design they're supposed to put the same amount out of each hole that rarely happens unfortunately these concrete boxes settle and so some come out faster than others um, or more than others and they they do make these speedy levelers that help um, put more equal amounts into each um, trench. There's also serial distribution. This would actually require a special request by ADEQ or to your county to be able to put these in, but actually these serial distribution are uses drop boxes. They're fabulous so that it comes down into this drop box and puts it out into whichever um, uh, trench is not full. Once that gets full, it goes down to the next one. And so these are a, really a fabulous way of putting things together because it typically does a better job of distributing the effluent than a distribution box. So how do we manage our drain field? Because remember, this is the most expensive part to replace. So we need to be diligent about protecting that drain field. So you want to make sure that you control the traffic. Don't let people 
drive over it. And for heaven's sakes, don't put it, um, uh, don't put concrete over it because when you put concrete over it, now you have no way to get the air underneath it. You want to make sure that you have inspection pipes. These inspection pipes are at the end of the lateral and um, it's where you can see and it's connected um, usually by a T to the end and then you can see then you can take this cap off and see how full the, um, the trench is. Having a full trench isn't necessarily bad. It's when it's rising up into the tube that it becomes, you can tell that it's plugged. And what you can also then do is see if this has six different laterals. It's a pretty big system. So you'd want to make sure that each one of them has water in it. If it doesn't, then they're not getting equal amounts of um, effluent. And it also shows you can just make sure that that is connected to into the system because maybe somehow one of these laterals is not really connected and so it never will receive effluent. Now, any questions before I go on to, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the Arizona Transfer of Property Inspection Program. Nothing in the chat at this point. Okay, we'll have more time. Um, in a, a few minutes as well as you think about things. So there has been some misunderstandings about what the Arizona Transfer of Property Inspection Program is. So in this case, we require when a house that has a septic system goes up for sale, the seller must have an inspection. And not any, just anybody can be an inspector. And an eligible inspector needs to have passed a course that's approved by ADEQ. They must also know about septic systems and they must know about your septic system and they must hold some kind of licensure. And there's about five different conditions that, um, are, that are in rule that a person can be. So that, that makes an eligible inspector. Then the inspector conducts the inspection of the entire system. There is a state unified inspection form that they must use, and they give that to the seller. The seller then gives the copy of the report and all relevant documentation to the buyer. Then the buyer completes the notice of transfer um, with the Arizona Department of um, Environmental Quality. That's what is supposed to happen. There are some people who are told that you do not have to, you can waive your right if it's just between seller or buyer and seller and there's no uh, professional in between. That's not true. You cannot waive your, um, the, the inspection. The lien the, the title agency, the lien holders, the banks, nobody has the legal right to waive an inspection. Unfortunately, much um, many of the inspection reports are given to the homeowner at closing. So as they're, they're signing two inches uh, worth of paper, they're given the inspection report. And by that time, it's usually too late. If there is a problem, that doesn't mean it can't be transferred. It may mean, depending on what county you're in, that it may need to be fixed. But also, no inspection. The, so the inspector who does the inspection cannot tell you that it needs to be corrected before you can sell your property. And it doesn't need, and the inspector cannot say that you have to have it um, inspected or they won't pass it. Um, there are three, so there are three levels of um, the, the, the results are either functional, functional with concerns, or not functional. And even if something comes up as not functional, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't sell your property. Now, the buyer's uh, lending agency or title agency may require it getting fixed, and that becomes a negotiation between the buyer and the seller. The other thing that you need to know about is properties with cesspools. 
cesspools are not to be used, period, in Arizona. They have not been able to be used since the ninth, early 1970s. Now, if there is a property with a cesspool, again, it doesn't preclude the sale of the property. The buyer, however, cannot use it as their, sol their source of wastewater disposal. But, um, so typically that would have to be taken care of so that someone could actually move into the property and use it. So any questions on the Arizona Transfer of Property Inspection Program? Don't see anything thus far. Okay. I am going to see if I missed a poll. Stop sharing results. Okay. I will do one more poll in a little bit. Alrighty. Um, yes. Question or comment. Um, my 1.5 year old system experiences extreme lush weed growth, different species from the rest of the yard, both at the tank cleaning ports, over the tank, and at the leach field inspection ports. May I conclude from this, what may I conclude from this observation? A leakage uh, situation exists? Question mark. So is, the, uh, is it spongy when you walk on the surface? Just because there is a difference in vegetation doesn't necessarily mean that you have a leak. It may mean that it has more moisture in the soil that those that is unusual, right? Because we live in a desert that typically gets three to 12 inches of, of rain a year. And when you put in a septic tank, it puts or a septic system, it puts a lot more moisture into the soil. So what you need to watch out for, is it mushy? Is it, is it spongy? Is it wet at the surface? At that point, you you should have concerns. I would have concerns. It may mean a lot of different things. It, um, I would I would pump out the tank because that could tell you um, a couple of different things. Um, it would tell you because you could then it's only a year and a half old. It shouldn't need it after a year and a half. But if you if if you look underneath because oftentimes they have cameras um, or they can even use a mirror that they put down to there um, and they can look and see if you've had backups in the system. That could be overuse. It could mean that there is a pinched or a, um, uh, a, a pinched area after the septic tank. It could mean there's a plug at the distribution box. It could mean a lot of different things. So it, if, if your soil is spongy, it means that you have some detective work to do. Thank you, Kit. You're welcome. So we're gonna summarize and then I'll open it up again for more questions. So what conditions are important to maximize the system function? We, one, we need to provide an environment in the soil that allows the bacteria to thrive. That means we need to have proper temperature and pH and no deterrent to growth. And then we need um, anaerobic conditions in the septic tank. And then we also need um, a watertight, structurally sound septic tank. We need sufficient time in the tanks in the soil. We need five feet, two to five feet of slow downward flow through dry aerobic soil, but it can't be too coarse, it can't be too fine. And then we need a, we need good uh, setbacks, horizontal distances from wells, surface water um, to the soil treatment area. So now I welcome any further questions and I will stop sharing so I can see your faces if you'd like. And then um, someone has pictures. 
I'm going to have to save it. Drag. Okay. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question as well at this point. Yes. Um, I sent the pictures of bugs in my system. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, they, uh, the last septic uh, workshop I attended, they had pictures of some nasty bugs um, that clogged up the filter or the screen. And I went and checked mine. Yeah, there's the larva. And then I also had a picture of the fly uh, oh, that I, yeah, drain flies. That's what. So are, uh, are, are these bad? Are these good? How uh, I cleaned it uh, several months ago, and then I just did it before this, and I was surprised at how many, how clogged it was again. Um. So I don't know so how they got there. They. I'm. Um, I'm not an expert on drain flies. That you, you are lucky that you do have an expert in your county that knows a lot about drain flies. And I would have to go and I'd actually have to consult her um, myself. Um, it's, uh, I would, so it's Dawn Long from American Septic System. Okay. And she is an expert on drain flies. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Kit, it's Marianne again. Um, yes. There was a discussion at a, a groundwater um, meeting, protection meeting, about Ugh. leach nice scale. having the capability of releasing arsenic in soils um, that would could possibly infiltrate into groundwater and because a health issue. Have has that come up in terms of septic use? Uh, so I, I think I missed the first part. So there is you have naturally occurring arsenic in your soil that when you when it's um, subject to excessive amounts of water, it leaches it out. With bleach. Oh, with bleach. I missed that part. Yeah. Um, so what we recommend with any cleaning product that it's normally safe in small quantities in regular household use. What we find is when people um, use it on their in their toilets, in their showers, on their surfaces of their sink, or they have a bleach cleaning day, that it can affect the septic system and actually kill off the good bacteria. Okay. But typically, we're not seeing a lot because bleach is, is a chlorine based, right? And so it tends to volatilize out and it sits in the septic tank long enough that it usually isn't a problem. But if you're using a lot of bleach in water and that water doesn't have enough time to reside in that septic tank to, to off gas, then it puts it into the soil, which then gives it another opportunity to off gas. So I wouldn't, my gut instinct is that it shouldn't be a problem in septic tanks because there are two areas where off-gassing can occur mm -hmm. um and so and people typically aren't bleaching that heavily in fact when you go to clean your septic tank you don't need to scrub down the walls you just you just pump it out and you pump out every bit that you can possibly get and that's as good it needs to get you don't need to do any further cleaning of a septic tank um, so we recommend just be reasonable and mindful, I guess, is what I want to say. Be mindful of your um, your household cleaning use. Also, never put anything down the toilet that hasn't gone through your body first, if you can um, at all help it. You always um, 
On your sink drains, you have a, a strainer that you clean out regularly because you don't want that to go down. We have a we have a garbage disposal on ours that we use maybe once every three weeks, um, just because it it's it came with the house. We know that resale of the house that will be better, but we don't use it very often. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are ways of managing your system um, that would protect the groundwater and its length. Thank you. So no bleach days. No bleach days. Correct. Due to a low use of my, I've been assuming that I don't have to get it checked as often. I have a question. All right. Promise you won't laugh? Yes. Oh, never mind. Um, we, over our drain field, we have a number of sycamore trees. Does that sound like a problem to you? I will admit right away, I am not a vegetative a person that knows vegetation. Okay. We do, though, try sycamore trees, as far as I know, are drought tolerant, I believe. What, the problem with, with deep-rooted vegetation near a septic system is that the roots can find a way into any cracks, leaks, or holes. And so you could be developing a root issue in the tank, the distribution, or the distribution media. Um, that's okay. what we have found. Okay. Uh, the drain field is some distance away from the tanks. Okay, good. So the root system uh, could, in my opinion, cause some issues with the, what I don't know what the drain field looks like under there, whether it's a parallel system or serial or what, but uh, we've never had a problem. I well, mean, that's good. That, but just because you haven't had a problem doesn't mean you don't have a problem. I know. <laughs> because um, the way we measure problems is that it goes away. And just because it goes away, it may not go away treated. That's been one of the problems that I've had with people who don't ever pump out their tanks is that they say, we've never had to pump out our tank. We've owned it for 20 years. We've never had to pump it out. Well... That may show you have a problem that you actually have a leak in your tank. And so now you're putting untreated wastewater deep down in the soil that doesn't get treated. Okay. We're going to have it inspected. So That's a great idea. I highly encourage that. And so this is a good segue into Lisa's question about that she protects her septic system by using it minimally. She only puts, um, uh, she, I have a, a cousin that also only puts TP uh, toilet paper in the water when there's a good poop. Otherwise he wants all women to make sure that they put uh, the rest in this, in the trash can. And, and, and that's a fine, um, there's nothing wrong with that. And um Let's see, it says, uh, in fact, in the 10 years I've lived here, I've never had it checked or pumped. I would think that after, and after 10 years, it might be a good opportunity for you to find out the condition of your tank. Um, is it filling up? Is it got, how? what is its structural um, integrity? Um, and then it may be that everything is just fine, and then you'll get another good 10 years out of it. Um, and so for me, I want to know what the integrity of my tank system is, what I've got in there is, are my baffles working correctly? And, um, so it's important, I think, to know what you have. So I, do we, I think we have a a bit of time if people are willing to, to stick around a bit longer to, um, answer Madeline's, um, maybe she could unmute herself and ask 
quickly some questions about integrating rain harvesting, gray water design with septic. All right. Um, if it doesn't become too long of a discussion, we could take that on. Yeah, uh, hi. Um, so by practitioner, I mean that I do rainwater harvesting and I install gray water systems, okay. uh, mostly in Pima County, but um, I do usually about one out of every 10 clients has a septic tank. Uh -huh. And so I just wanted to get more informed about them. Um, right. And for the most part, with rainwater harvesting, um, you contour the landscape to keep water on site to infiltrate to either existing trees or new trees that you're adding. Um, and to the goal is to not use municipal or groundwater at all. Correct. Um, so when there's a septic tank or a leach field, I just avoid it entirely. I don't put any basins there. Um, I try not to infiltrate water around it. Um, but I guess my two main questions are, is that all I need to do or is there something else to consider with recontouring the land? And for gray water, some people have septic tanks, but then they want to divert what they can of gray water to um, let's say like edible trees, like figs or pomegranate. Does that, is there anything there that might impact, you know, the lower uh, volume of water going to their septic system that I should let them know about? N not typically. I think that um, what's allowed to be used for gray water in Arizona is um, your bathroom sinks and your shower, but not your kitchen and your toilet. Correct. So, um, so uh, for gray water harvesting, I like to see them use it as quickly as they can um, from collection, because uh, I hate to see uh, at 100 and 20 degrees outside, gray water sitting around for any amount of time. Um, the, the other thing that I want to make sure is that there is a um, shutoff valve that can be then um, turned on. So it, the, the gray water system goes into the septic tank and the septic tank needs to be able to handle all the gray water. What I have seen is that people tend to use gray water systems as a band-aid to prolong the use of their septic system. And that's not legal actually in Arizona. That's not a um, way of handling that. But if, you, if people want to use their gray water in a beneficial manner. I have no problem with that. What I don't want to see again is it, it doesn't leave the property. You know, there are best management practices that ADEQ put out that no dogs can roll around in um, the effluent. Um, and with rainwater harvesting and the a passive method of um, contouring the soil, as, as you said, you want to divert any rainwater or even gray water use away from the septic system. So you don't want it to go onto the tank. You don't need any extra water going onto the tank. And you certainly don't want to add any more water onto the leach field or the soil treatment area because that just makes the soil treatment area have to work harder. Um, and it's not a beneficial use. You, you, you kind of lost your, um, your means, uh, your, your reason for doing the uh, rainwater harvesting, but I think you've got the right idea in mind. Yep. Okay. And what about a uh, last question, adding more organic material. Usually people are interested in wood chips or mulch as a cover, mm -hmm. sometimes for dust control or aesthetics, um, but we also use it for, you know, soaking up, acting as a sponge, especially for gray water basins. Um, would putting mulch or wood chips over the leach field affected? You know, that's a good question. I hadn't really given that any thought. What that does is give area for bacteria to cling to. Um, so in that case, I would put it, I would distribute it so that the wood chips remain dry if mm. possible. Um, so that, uh, and that any wicking up would go, have to go through the soil to get to the wood chips and that protects them, the wood chips from getting any pathogens collected on the surface. 
Mm -hmm. um, even though wood is a really good, um, it, it captures, it can capture the bacteria and it can, when it air dries then, or when the soil hits or the sun hits it, it will kill those pathogens. Well, you're always going to have that bit that isn't in the, that doesn't get dry perhaps, or it doesn't mm -hmm. hit the sun. And those are the, the areas where I get concerned that the, um, the, the family dog might dig in there and get it underneath their nails and then bring it into the house. And then the baby crawls across the floor and you can get some transmission of disease that way. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. I have one last, I think I've got one last thing that I'd like to share with you. Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry, come on. Let me share my screen. Okay. I have my last poll is I have a question after this presentation. How would you rate your understanding of septic systems? compared to when you came in. Sometimes you didn't know what you didn't know. And then um, is there something that you would change in how you manage your system now that you've seen the presentation? I have a question while we're all filling out your poll. Sure. Should, should your leach field basically just be barren with nothing on it then? Um, I've had wild grasses just take over and I've weeded it. But no, you can have wild grasses go on there. Now, see, that's where I don't know about vegetation. I do know that there are some native grasses that have really deep root systems. And um, it depends on how, how close to the surface your um, soil treatment area is, but um, back east where they have natural precipitation, there's lots of times where there's grass growing over the leach field and or, or the drain field, and that's no, not a problem. In fact, there have been, you can actually see where it's um, stripes of darker green where the, the leach field is compared to the area in between. And that's okay too. It just shows that the nitrogen is being used. Um, what we don't want you to do is put vegetation over that needs a lot of extra water, right? Because that water then, normally the irrigation goes past the, um, the root zone and then can go down and add an extra stressor to the uh, soil treatment area. But vegetation in its own right isn't necessarily bad. But if you, I would recommend a shallow rooted drought tolerant type of plant. And one of the things that you can do is you can irrigate it and wait 45 minutes. And then you can put a soil probe down and see how far your irrigation has gone. And then don't and then you want to make sure it doesn't go beyond the root zone. And then it stays there and it won't then leach away and then travel on down and, and impact your soil treatment area. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. So I've had nine out of the 10 of you answer my questions. And I just wanted to share with you what's going on. And we went from most people having a fair knowledge to people having either good or excellent knowledge. So I'm really proud of you for learning something and paying attention. And then I'm glad that you will change how you manage your system. This doesn't allow me to have you fill in things, but maybe I don't know if they send out a question, what one thing would you change? That would be great. Um, and I'm glad that three of you are uh, managing at a good level and feel like you are protecting both your septic tank and your um, soil treatment area. So I'll stop sharing. And I'm here to answer any other questions before we, in fact, I think we've got one minute left. 
Just one comment. This was excellent, and I will fix again. Thank you. You're so welcome. I appreciate it. I, I'm thinking maybe do a little quick research on the depths of some of the native plant root systems and get that out to people. We can, Good idea. I, I figure we're, we're looking for something less than five feet deep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Please make it yeah. two, two or less. Okay. Because then... What, because one of the problems is, is that you're going to, you, even drought tolerant native species needs rain occasionally. And so um, when you put it in an area that it doesn't naturally grow in, but you're putting sort of a native for the, your area, but it would maybe grow in an arroyo where it receives more water, you may mm -hmm. have to irrigate it. Well, then you have to be really careful about how much you have to how much irrigation you have to have and then there's maybe areas that where it's splotchy but you do irrigation broadcast so there's going to be areas where there's there's no plants root systems to take it up so i just be real careful about about how deep you go i would rather not have and roots any deeper than two feet um, because you're always, that's the average root depth, remember, because yes. there's always going to be a few that are super growers <laughs> yeah. and you don't want to, uh, anything to get into your, um, into your distribution line. Excellent. Thank you. That's great, um, advice. Well, I believe that that ties it up for us today. Unless anyone has a last minute comment question, we will thank Kit so much for being here and doing another excellent, excellent septic care workshop. Thank you so much. You're and welcome. Thank you all for attending. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Bye. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.